Welcome to Resource PNG. Papua New Guinea's coffee export has declined this year after the recent El Nino that affected farmers throughout the country's coffee growing areas. The Coffee Industry Corporation reports that crop yields dropped in quality to its lowest in history, reducing the amount of exports. But amidst the country's financial problems, the central bank says coffee has done well to contribute to vital export revenue. Bethany Harriman with this report. Coffee is the highest foreign exchange earning agricultural commodity in the country and the central bank says coffee exports have been good and could help with the current lack of foreign currency. In Lay, the branch of the coffee industry corporation that deals with coffee exports out from the Lay port has reported that since January, the number of coffee bags have declined. Okay, on the March uh, this year we did a bit quite more than last year. We did over 41,000 bags. Last year's crop was uh, 39,000, 37,000, correct me here. And the overall for the quarter for last year was over 111,000 bags. For this year, we did only 109,000 bags. CIC Senior Export Officer Marie Kiliawi says the numbers show that coffee exports have declined slightly this year. The damage to the Yonki Kolwara section of the Highlands Highway, the Banner Bridge and the El Nino has been contributing factors. Last year's crop was not as good. So, um, but from uh, interviews with far, uh, farmers and other people out there in the industry, we are expecting a good yield uh, this year. But it's been slow uh, because of what happened last year. We had this uh, dry season last year, so um, slowly we are now receiving, I mean, a good number of uh, coffee coming in through. So we're expecting a good, uh, a good season this year, especially starting June. But as you said, um, the season started a little bit late. Usually it should come in by uh, April, May. Coffee contributes consistently to foreign currency coming into the country, but most importantly, it puts money into the people's pockets. Okay, when you really look at a coffee tree back at home, it has been planted, you know, probably by a great-grandfather. And the same coffee tree has come down in generation, help, help generations after generation. The same coffee tree has been there and, you know, they, they pruned it and the same coffee tree has been harvested and, you know, they sold it. It took care of their necessities. The cash flow coming from coffee is nowhere near to that of the extractive industries. But the central bank has highlighted coffee bringing in vital foreign currency through exports at this time when foreign currency reserves are depleting in the central bank. Commodity prices also for other exports commodities are also stabilized and I think there's some good improvement, uh, especially for cocoa, palm oil, and uh, I think coffee also. So um, now, and then the Kina depreciation is another thing. The adjustment to that uh, in terms of supplying foreign exchange would have been that uh, um, exporters uh, would take advantage of the lower kina and increase the production and exports. Now we're hearing also already that uh, and seeing already that uh, coffee is good, is reacting to that, very good uh, um, exports. More exporters are selling direct to overseas markets. And of course, cocoa and uh, co uh, copra in Eastern Bougainville, East New Britain and Bougainville are very much uh, increasing. So this is very good. It's a positive story. El Nino and the um, problems with the road and bridge bridge along the highways. That's why the stats is um, a bit below than last year for the overall quarter, January to March. And April, um, we did f over 45,000 bags as compared to last year was 54,000, over 54,000. And for, for May, uh, May just ended, so I'll give you a, a provisional figures what we have on record. We just did 46,000 bags. And as compared to last year, we did over 67,000 bags for, for the month of May. 
in in the coffee season, uh, beginning of May, that's when the coffee season, you know, the flood season comes in. But as compared to last year, we can see that we for this year it's a bit slow. The coffee industry has suffered greatly this year. A sharp drop in prices because of poor quality brought about by the adverse effects of the El Nino and damages to the Highlands Highway that delayed freight to lay. From our reports last year, the last quarter last year, October to December and January to March this year, uh, we've seen that uh, a lot of those uh, defects or rubbish that we see in coffee uh, were white and old beans. So it's really because of long storage, long storage, and those were the kind of uh, uh, things that affect, you know, the cooker quality. And that was one of the major things that we see. Those Coffee may not be exporting billions of dollars for Papua New Guinea, but during times like this, when world prices for oil, gas, and minerals slump, coffee does become significant. It also brings to light that the agricultural sector doesn't get the support it deserves to reach its full potential. Coffee exports are said to increase this month. The Bank of South Pacific has already released a report that coffee exports have indeed improved. Papua New Guinea contributes an estimated 1 million bags annually. That's 1% of the total world production for coffee. But those figures may decrease this year because coffee, like all other agricultural commodities, are exporting but are struggling because they need more government support. Stay tuned for more of Resource PNG. Don't go away. Welcome back to Resource PNG. To some news from InterOil, and this week the company held its annual general meeting. Moves by the founder of InterOil in regaining control of the board of InterOil have been unsuccessful following the company's AGM. Shareholders of InterOil have overwhelmingly voted to re-elect all eight directors put forward by the current board of the company, rejecting the nominees put forward by the company's founder and former chairman and CEO, Phil Muloshek. Here is an update. In an announcement to the markets this week, the re-elected board thanked shareholders for having confidence in them to serve another term, saying the results of the AGM underscore the recognition by shareholders of the steps that the current board and management team have taken to transform into oil. The re-elected board members include Chairman Chris Finlayson, CEO Michael Hessian, and Executive Director Izzy Kelly Taureka. In what has been described as the biggest deal in the oil and gas industry in Papua New Guinea, the proposed acquisition of InterOil by OilSearch has been welcomed by many, both locally and abroad. Since the announcement of the proposed acquisition in May, InterOil has also had to deal with its own in-house battle. Former Chairman and CEO Phil Mulashek has been leading a group of shareholders in a bid to gain control of the board of InterOil. Muloshek recently went to the Canadian Supreme Court in a bid to defer InterOil's AGM, but this proved unsuccessful. The AGM went ahead, with shareholders voting to re-elect the current board nominees of the company. InterOil has now also resolved to convene a special meeting of shareholders on July the 28th to vote on the proposal put forward by OilSearch. Many analysts point to the fact that most shareholders have already agreed in principle to the acquisition by OilSearch and expect this deal to be agreed to, paving the way for OilSearch to become Papua New Guinea's first major oil and gas company. On the local front, this move by OilSearch to acquire InterOil has also received support, particularly from government. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill has thrown his support behind this deal, as well as Petroleum and Energy Minister Ben Micah. Until we set these things up, you know, the state and the people of PNG mostly receive our benefits from royalties and tax. And uh, one school of thought in the politics to the leaders is that government should not become involved in 
the private sector, you know, we should just collect our <coughs> uh, revenue from tax duties and other fiscal arrangements that uh, are in built into the projects. Private sector must invest, private sector must manage, own and drive the development of business in the economy. Yeah. You acknowledge that and, and thank you and congratulate you for the achievement which has now resulted in this kind of uh, you know reports. You know, it makes me very proud to be seeing you at the table in your first idea. You know, something like this. Huh? Not many of your of your colleague companies or sister or brother companies are already <laughs> You know, the, the, the reports now are being produced by the Auditor General, you know. You know, we must clearly separate the fiscal requirement of the budget from investment strategy of the government. The investment strategy is to continue to add value, you know, to what we are getting from these projects. So when the oils are dry, the oil wells are dry and the gas is gone, you know, we have something there that we can touch, we can see, and continues to stabilize inflow of revenue from investments that have been established uh, from reinvestment of this uh, money. So, you see, I am very, very concerned. On the commercial front, state company Kumul Petroleum Holdings Limited has also shown its support for this deal to go ahead. Speaking at its recent annual general meeting, KPHL chairman Frank Kramer as well as Managing Director Wapu Song, are optimistic of the opportunities that may present themselves as a result of this acquisition going ahead. Good news on the Papua LNG project, of course, has been recently in the media in respect of the oil search takeover bid uh, for the intro oil shares and its arrangement and relationship with Total. There are potential cost benefits and synergies in this rationalization exercise and um, we as Kumo Petroleum are very very happy to see government support for this initiative and uh, we stand ready to represent um, the state's interest in how Kumo Petroleum can participate in this exciting opportunity. Future projects as you know will continue to expand into, into the project and we're working on Pinyang uh, very closely with ExxonMobil. Uh, we're working US Minister you've given us the timeline uh, to work towards so we're working closely with ExxonMobil and uh, government agencies to, to deliver that Pinyang project. Hopefully that will, that will maintain 8 million ton per annum uh, when, the, when the license is granted. And we will be able to actually develop the upstream infrastructure uh, to, to expand the project. And then Papua LNG is the next one uh, that we're working with Total on. Uh, that's going through uh, survey work and you know, uh, social mapping and different work that you are already aware of, and and with the transaction that's happened uh, recently with all sets taking over into uh, with the backing of Total, that that basically makes it very easy uh, in terms of the joint venture uh, structure. Total, all sets, and us uh, will be the with the partners, and uh, we all aligned in terms of moving forward and taking advantage of the, the low commodity prices, the, the uh, you know, cheaper, uh, cheaper you know, construction cost that we uh, try and target these this, this low prices before the price comes up and contracting becomes expensive and construction of the project becomes expensive. Whilst there have been some concerns raised, particularly from the Independent Consumer Competition Commission, the proposed acquisition of uh, into oil by oil search. Uh, you know, there is a statutory process uh, stipulated under the IEEC Act that requires uh, any major acquisitions uh, in this country, uh, they are required to come to the IEEC. And uh, we are concerned that we have not been uh, reliably informed or made aware of that proposal until uh, it came out in today's paper. Lately, we've, we've realized this, uh, that uh, most of these business houses are just going ahead and acquiring one after another, uh, selling off shares to each other, and we've been uh, very silent on this one because uh, the IEEE Act has been, uh, uh, is not very mandatory for them to come to us, and that is why, so we've lately shifted this one to make it mandatory, so everyone will now be coming to the IEEE for 
any major acquisitions then. Research has stated that they will continue to ensure all parties are involved in discussions for this deal before the deal is sealed. Well, I think firstly, um, this deal allows us to be substantially more influential in making sure that the next phase of development uh, in PNG for LNG is done in the most capital effective, the most timely way. We do genuinely believe that with cooperation between the two projects, we can reduce the capital costs. That means that, that um, the tax that we pay as a developer will be higher and will, be, will result in more benefits coming back to the state. That's just one aspect. We, can also, we also believe that with cooperation we can accelerate development, uh, say address some of the economic needs through a large scale investment in PNG, bringing jobs, bringing uh, skills, uh, in, in a similar way to how PNG LNG was back in 2010. And let's face it, we need that stimulation in the economy to really drive growth and allow us to collectively deliver services that are so desperately needed by our people. You're watching Resource PNG. We will be back with more after these messages. Welcome back. Time now to take a look at what's been making headlines in Resource News. Imagine drinking water from this river. For the people of Juwaka province, having access to clean water has been almost impossible. Since the El Nino experience in 2015, They've been obtaining water from Wagi River. Agriculture has also been affected. Struggles of individuals to obtain water and food have led to a number of deaths. A climate phenomena turned social phenomena. Since 2015, we've been experiencing drought, thus affecting the growth of sweet potato. Many families out here have been affected. Weather patterns have returned to normal, however, agriculture production has not improved due to months of water shortage. European Union and the International Organization for Migration have been quick to respond to areas affected in the Highlands region. Yesterday, Ambassador for European Union and Regional Director for International Organization for Migration launched a bore water in Giramben village in Jiwaka, which is one of five in the province. Both organizations are also supporting affected communities with planting materials and seeds required to build garden staples. These special provisions, which is at the order, I would say, of 20 million kina, the, only this year to support uh, the government efforts and the efforts of the provinces and the different departments to facilitate the resistance and resilience of local population against the drought and against the linear. And engagement with the community is part of the core approach of IOM. Our strategy of IOM's projects, particularly for the water, the boreholes here, is really engaging the community. It's a shared responsibility. Autonomous Spokeville Government's Associate Minister of the Community Development Department says that Bougainville should learn from Guam on tourism. The minister accompanied the Bougainville group, who was part of the Papua New Guinea delegation to the 12th Festival of Pacific Arts in Guam. Mr. Sawa says that Guam is a resourceless island territory without mining oil or petroleum, but it's only through tourism that generates 60% of its revenue that the government sustains its economy. They are attracting a lot of uh visitors all throughout the world, which are, they're coming in to, uh, to see what's here in, in, uh, in Guam. And we have seen the hospitality industry, the sightseeing on their beaches, all these happenings are attracting and stimulating the process in uh, tourism. Mr. Sauer says that tourism is a great market and Bougainville has many products which must be explored. 
and if tourism is prioritized, it will be a major economic drive for the region's internal revenue. In Bougainville, so I believe that as a government, we need to take uh, into consideration by promoting tourism. The port you know, of gold in tourism needs it's an untapped uh, resource that we need to tap into to, to actually subsidize or sustain our economy to to look after the budget that, that, that can actually take care of our population. So, Because of the financial hardships encountered, Mr. Sauer says that the autonomous Bougainville government must be self-reliant. Minister Kulang said the responsibility for tourism development is a shared one. He said provincial governments and district development authorities need to understand that they play a key role and need to develop their own tourism plans for the provinces and the districts. The Tourism Zone Initiative is the national government's effort in lifting the profile of PNG as an ideal tourist destination. This will be the forerunner in our selling tourism in Papua New Guinea. So that means the hotel and hospitality, roads, the security, the energy, the communication network, all of this has to be there. In May, Minister Kulang attended the first World Conference on Tourism for Development Summit Forum in Beijing, China, where the United Nations declared 2017 as the year of sustainable tourism development. Okay, that is emanating from the fact that 2015 tourism uh, contributed 10% to GDP. Okay, global. global. Uh, like Fiji, it's 35%. Some others like higher than 10%. So we are in a world where tourism is seriously contribution to uh, uh, countries' growth in terms of economic contribution. It's 10% on average, and in PNG, it's a mediocre 2% when we have got so much to offer. He commended Kokopo and the East New Britain provincial government and stakeholders for advancing their master plan. Minister Kulang and his team will be in Alotau this week to ensure they are well into their tourism master plan development. The minister will also be sending out teams this week across the seven highlands provinces to account for the region's tourism products and destinations. We are going to host uh, probably the first time biggest tourism conference in, in the highlands in Mount Hagen. We would like to advise the community that especially those places that we are going, uh, we want the uh, stakeholders to start to rise up and see uh, the new direction tourism is taking in this country. He said the Tourism Development Initiative will ensure PNG comes on par to capture the opportunities that international tourism is providing in terms of contribution to economic growth, job creation and poverty alleviation. He said key stakeholders and donor agencies are keen to support the cause. Minister Kulang thanked the World Bank for coming on board and pledging support to the tune of 20 million US dollars to assist the initial three tourism hubs. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Resource PNG. If you'd like to get in touch with us, email us on the address now showing on your screen. For all the latest updates on developments within the resource sector in the country, check out our Facebook page. To view this program online, log on to the MTV website where you will find a link to the Resource PNG page. Until the next time, pleasant viewing. Bye for now.